Hello and welcome to Matthew's Xmas Reviews. Or should I start calling it Keymas? Kymas, maybe? I mean, that's the Greek leather, not an X. Anyway, you might have noticed that I skipped my annual Haunted Reviews this year. Well, that's mostly due to the fact that my story writer wants to try slowing down and putting more effort into the production process. So then you might be asking yourself why I'm still doing my Xmas Reviews. Well, if you've seen my previous Xmas review, you might recall that I became a part of Red Ribbon Reviewers, which is a charity thing to raise awareness for AIDS research. For more information on that, check out the link in the description. I'm basically just doing this because it's for a good cause. Anyway, on to the subject of today's review. Honestly, I kind of wanted to start the My Little Pony Christmas special reviews with, with Winter Wrap-Up for reasons I'll get into when I review it, but seeing as I have Heartwarming Eve in my holiday intro, I figured I might as well just go with that first. Besides, Winter Wrap-Up is more of a general winter episode than an actual Christmas episode. Sadly, I don't have any of the relevant characters to join me for this review after my falling out with the Ace Wings. My universe's Doctor Who's is off who knows where, or when knows where, maybe both, and my story writer doesn't know any voice actors who can play any of the more mechanical characters or the Australia Blue team. And if that wasn't bad enough, we couldn't even get the right rendered 3D costumes for the title card. Oh well, cue the holiday intro. The episode starts as our protagonists on the train on their way to Canterlot. After some banter, they arrive and... Hey, what are the Kira Crusaders doing there all on their own? Or did they come with the main six? They don't really establish this. They start playing a game of I Spy by saying exactly what they're looking at. Pretty sure that's not how that game works. After the intro, a bunch of ponies pile into the castle where a stage is set up. Can I be in this episode? Oh, double bugger. Backstage, the main six are preparing to perform a play. Twilight seems happy about it, but Fluttershy is naturally having a bit of stage fright. And already pulls a Pinkie Pie by very much not helping. I wish she hadn't honored me quite so much. I can't go on stage. I don't want every pony looking at me. Fluttershy, which I darling, there's nothing to feel nervous about. We're in the Canterlot pageant, the biggest, most important production in all of Equestria. A lot of ponies will come to watch us. A lot? Hundreds. Hundreds? <gasps> Maybe even thousands! <gasps> also, apparently, Canterlot mirrors seem to randomly switch between shadows and actual reflections. Weird. Rainbow Dash seems to be getting a little too into it while entirely missing the point, and Applejack exposits that they're putting on a reenactment of the founding of Equestria. It's a reenactment of the founding of Equestria. It's not the Rainbow Dash show. Well, it should be the Rainbow Dash show. I'm the star. The dramatic irony of Rainbow Dash seemingly not knowing about what happens to her character is later ruined by the fact that she clearly memorized her lines beforehand. Yeah, I know, it's surprising for a character like her to memorize her lines. Anyway, Spike tells them that there's not much time left before they start, but things are starting to look a bit hectic. He then starts up the opening narration, and I'll just let him explain it because he does a much better job than I can manage. 
Once upon a time, long before the peaceful rule of Celestia, and before ponies discovered our beautiful land of Equestria, ponies did not know harmony. It was a strange and dark time, a time when ponies were torn apart by hatred. <laughs> I know, can you believe it? During this frightful age, each of the three tribes, the Pegasi, the Unicorns, and the Earth Ponies, cared not for what befell the other tribes, but only for their own welfare. In those troubled times, as now, the Pegasi were the stewards of the weather. But they demanded something in return, food that could only be grown by the Earth Ponies. The unicorns demanded the same. In return for magically bringing forth day and night. And so mistrust between the tribes festered until one fateful day it came to a boil. And what prompted the ponies to clash? It was a mysterious blizzard that overtook the land and toppled the tribes for precarious peace. The normally industrious earth ponies were unable to farm their land. The earth ponies were freezing. The home of the Pegasi fared no better. The Pegasi were hungry. And the unicorns were freezing and hungry. Even the unicorn's magic was powerless against the storm. Each tribe blamed the others for their suffering, and the angrier every pony grew, the worse the visit became. And so it was decided that a grand summit would be held to figure out a way to cope with the blizzard. Each tribe sent their leaders. Daughter of the Unicorn King, Princess Platinum. Ruler of the Pegasi, Commander Hurricane. And lastly, leader of the Earth Ponies, Chancellor Puddinghead. Perhaps the three tribes could finally settle their differences and agree on a way to get through this disaster. Needless to say, things didn't quite work out. Before the commercial break, we see some suspicious spectral-looking equines from above the clouds watching the commotion. The three leaders return to their homes to meet with their loyal advisors, Private Pansy, Clover the Clever, and Smart Cookie to complain to them. Well, Puddinghead doesn't really much uh, complain as she acts random. But she comes up with a surprisingly clever plan of traveling somewhere to find a new place to grow food. And with me as our fearless leader, what could go wrong? Where should I start? Turns out the other two leaders just so happened to have the same idea. I just love these unrealistic coincidences in cartoons. Each of these leaders have trouble finding a new land, however. Private Pansy's timidness and Commander Hurricane's gung-ho attitude winds up slowing them down. And Princess Patnam doesn't like putting actual effort into anything. Also this. That is what's wrong! Your Highness, it's just a stream. And Chancellor Puddinghead's randomness get her and Smart Cookie completely lost. But thankfully, Smart Cookie tricks her into giving up the map. They all then soon arrive in the land that would eventually become Equestria, and each of the leaders claim the land as their own. I proclaim this new land to be... Pegasopolis! I hereby dump this land, Unicornia! What a joy it is to be here in Unicornia! about Earth. Earth! Congratulations to me for thinking of it. We, we found, found our new home. home. Jeez, for pony and smart cookie, that's not really a very original name. Especially considering that Chancellor Pudding had earlier revealed that the name of the planet they are on is in fact Earth. Think of this what you will. 
However, the six ponies quickly realized that they claimed the same land at the same time, and things quickly turn south and cold winds start blowing as they argue. But Clover, Cookie, and Pansy all agree that their leaders should let cooler heads prevail. And surprisingly, all their leaders disagree with them. A few snowballs are flying and the six realize that the bizarre snowy weather from before is back. As are the suspicious spectral equines. Who does Matt do think he is? I'm so frustrated right now. You've been angry at him for over a month now. Don't you think you could just give it a rest? Why don't you give it a rest? Give what a rest? I don't know. Trying to calm me down, I guess. But I only just now suggested it. I don't care. Leave it alone. Something's not right. I know it. It's not his style to stay angry for this long. Wing, maybe it's best if you go talk it out with Matt too. Oh, I'll do something to Matt too, all right? Oh, this isn't good. I need to follow him. And so the paradise that the ponies had found soon lost buried beneath a thick blanket of snow and hard feelings. Instead of beautiful, it was blizzardy. Instead of wonderful, it was wintry. Instead of spectacular, it was snow-tacular. Instead of... We get it! Move on! Done with it! Yes! Get on with it! Get on with it! The pony seats shelter in a cave together, much to their dismay, and lines are literally drawn in the dirt. Tensions come to a head as the leaders fight over a simple rock, I was always joking, but I'm not, and storm clouds gather as the entrance to the cave is frozen shut. The leaders continue arguing until they're completely frozen over, much to the dismay of their advisors. The three advisors huddle together in fear and finally notice the suspicious spectral equines, which Clover identifies as Windigos, while also revealing that Starsuil the Bearded, a pony known to be important to Equestria's history, happens to be Clover's mentor. Get it? Windigos? For anyone who might be watching this but haven't seen much of the show, get used to Equestria's wildlife having pun names. On a side note, I avoided using pronouns with Clover to Clover's gender as currently unknown, as there are conflicting accounts in the show's tie-in books, and the existing of gender-bending spells has not been documented, though Commander Hurricane is the only known stallion featured in this backstory, so it's entirely possible that Clover was male to hear to the same reverse Smurfette principle for both trio. Not to mention that the only pathogen counterpart was a male earth pony, Clever Clover. Anyway, Clover reveals that the Windigos feed off of fighting and hatred and that the more hate is generated, the colder things become. Not exactly the best evolutionary trait because their prey freeze over before they can get the most out of them. Clover and Cookie realize that the Windigos are targeted them because of the conflict between the three tribes, but it's Pansy who has to point out to the smart ones that the three of them harbor no animosity. This causes the Windigos to panic and they try to freeze the three quickly, but it's time for FRIENDSHIP EX MACHINA! The newly forged bond between the three activates a magical burst from Clover because friendship is magic and Clover is a unicorn, and the burst wards off the Windigos and forms the heart and the three realize that Let's friendship is magic. All through the night, the three ponies kept the fire of friendship alive by telling stories to one another and by singing songs, which of course became the winter carols that we all still sing today. Eventually, the warmth of the fire and singing and laughing reached the leaders, and their bodies began to thaw. And it even began to melt their hearts. The three leaders 
agreed to share the beautiful land and live in harmony ever afterwards. And together, they named their new land... Abrasia! And that's how Equestria was named! Now, I should probably talk about this issue with the flag. You see, Celestia and Luna wouldn't be the leaders of Equestria for a while, and Clover and Star Swirl go to them to ask them to lead the nation, which makes sense as they're alicorns, meaning that they have the traits of all three pony races. Personally, I find this to be fine, however, because the original design of the flag was most likely lost to history. At least that's my personal interpretation on the issue. After the play, the main six get into a brief quarrel, but reconcile after they hear a roar, thus ending the episode. There was quite a bit of world building in this episode, though it was explained further in the aforementioned books. There was decent humor and everything was basically average. And especially I found it amusing how similar the main six were to their roles. It was almost as though they were their ancestors. But that'd be almost as crazy as them having been reincarnated from a group of ancient Egyptian cats who just so happened to be acquainted with Discord. What the heck? I don't even have a continuity alarm. Even if I did, it wouldn't be this sensitive. I mean, it wasn't exactly the most canon-breaking story, unlike anything I could think of from IDW. Anyway, this episode gets a 4 out of 5. It was good, but nothing too exceptional. Matthew, you are going down- What's going on here? I don't know, he's been mad at you for over a month now. Wendigos! How can you be sure it's Wendigos? Look! Wait a second, those are Atherothian Wendigos, aren't they? Budget restrictions. What budget? Exactly! What's happening? Did he happen to eat any of your flesh? Well, he tried to bite me, but I managed to get away. Why? Do you know what happens when cannibalistic traits occur in the presence of a Wendigo? But that's Wendigos, not Wendigo. This is a Nexus universe. Pretty much any interpretation of anything is possible. Bottom line is that if we don't stop those things, Wendigos will become one of them. And how exactly do you plan to stop them? That's easy, actually. Every sort of Wendigo in the nearby multiverse, except the ones of the fire attribute, are weak to fire. And because Wingates would become a direct threat to me, I can intervene on this matter. Fyraja! Rafoli! Dragon's Breath! What? They're running away! I think the sun is coming up soon. Wait a second, I just remembered, you two are sync. Wingrace's transformation will just get cancelled out. Like when that half of Nightmare Joker took over his body. Speaking of that, how did and when did they escape? I don't really remember that. It was a confusing time for the story writer. You should just be glad he didn't fall off the face of the internet like half of Tumblr Pond apparently did at the time. I'm sorry, I guess I got a little too angry, and they managed to take advantage of my anger. Well, all's well that ends well, right? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, you got the meh ending. Be sure to stay tuned after the credits for alternate endings. G-A-M-E-O-V-E-R G-A-M-E-O-V-E-R A-O 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 Shit.